and welcome to the Style Matters Podcast. I'm Zandra, your host, and I am so glad you're here. If you're looking for ways to love your home, enhance its beauty, and above all, make it a place that both nurtures you and inspires you, then you're in the right place. On this show, I talk with the most thoughtful designers, stylists, and artists in the industry about why our environments have such a huge impact on our overall happiness and whether or not we go through our days uplifted or dragged down. I pick their brains for how they do what they do and how we can apply it to our own homes. I believe everyone deserves to have beauty in their lives, and if it's lacking in yours or if you just can't get enough of gorgeous interiors, this show is for you. I'm so glad you found us. Well, folks, this is the last episode of 2022. Next week, I fly to Italy with my family for the holidays. I'll be sharing photos of all kinds of design goodness via email, so be sure to sign up for that if you want some inspiration. And then when I get back, we'll hit the ground running with all new episodes of the Style Matters podcast starting January 9th, or maybe we'll start on January 2nd. I haven't decided yet. The takeaway here is to subscribe to the podcast on whichever podcast player you use so that you don't miss an episode. Now, as with all of our podcast seasons, I'd like to wrap them up with an extra special interview. Today, I'm talking with designer Amir Kandwala. From our conversation, I could tell that he has a gentle soul. He's sensitive to all aspects of a space, honoring both the history of design and the cultural essence of a country he's drawing from for a given project. He speaks softly, so you have to listen closely, but I think that's part of his charm. You'll want to lean into this one, soaking up everything he has to say. Here's Amir. Amir Kandwala, welcome to the Style Matters podcast. You were just in the New York Times, and it was about a room that I, a a whole home that I absolutely love, an apartment in Manhattan. So we are going to talk about that today. I'm really excited, but you have so many wonderful projects and they're all quite different. I'm really happy to have you here. Thank you, Zandra. It's an honor for me to be here. Thank you. And to be part of your lovely podcast. Thank Um, you. So let, let's talk a little bit about sort of the beginnings of your your journey into becoming the designer that you are today. You grew up in Karachi, moved to Manhattan to study at FIT as an undergraduate, and I believe you're mm-hmm. still living in Manhattan today. Yes. How much of your childhood in Pakistan, as well as your other travels, because I, I understand you are quite a traveler, how much of that seeps into your aesthetic as a professional, or or maybe even for your own personal style, because I know when you're working with clients, you kind of have to go with what they what they want and what's meaningful to them. But what about you personally? Traveling is a big part of my life, has always been. And I think it's part of my DNA because my my family was in the traveling business. Oh and, oh. and my and my grandfather started one of the first traveling agencies in Karachi in 1935, oh, wow. which, is, which is pre-partition, you know, yes. uh, from India. Right. Uh, so I feel that it's part of my DNA. Now, to answer your question more precisely in terms of travel and design, I feel that they're really connected, but I wouldn't necessarily say that everything that I do and everything that we do as a team is directly linked with my travel experiences. I think that they come into play every now and then. It's more about that feeling of being fearless because I feel that travel really helps open a mind, a perspective, a way of being, a way of seeing things differently than we normally do when we live in the same city or the same home for multiple years, right? It makes us it makes us a little bit safe. Yeah, yes, so, it, it, right. It gets so, us out of our comfort zone for sure, especially if you allow yourself to open up to the culture of a different city and all it has to offer. Yeah. So I think what traveling does, it really sparks curiosity. 
Yes, yes. You know, that's, yes. How I would, that's how I would answer your question. But in terms of my personal design and my travel, how do they come into play? I come from a culture that has a very long history, a very old history. You know, it has a lot of layers. Mm. Um, there are lots of colors. There are lots of flavors. Mm. There are a lot of textures. And the just the topog- topography of the country from the south to the north, it's, there's so much variation. Uh, yeah. So when you grow up, with such a deep sense of culture, you know, with music, travel, food, colors, interiors, they're all so related and you basically carry it where you, wherever you go. Yeah, so yeah. it's part of my DNA. I'll just share a, a small story with you. My partner and I took a sabbatical in 2011 and we mm. traveled extensively and we, we spent a, a long amount of time in Morocco. Mm. And we had an opportunity to go visit the factories of the, uh, the people who did all the work in the new Islamic galleries at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Oh, um, wow. They opened, they opened their doors. We went to visit them in Fez. You know, we saw how they do all the plaster work, the woodwork, <sighs> how they do, how they make the leech tiles. And, and that experience has stayed with me so to just bring it back to the nomad residence <sighs> that you saw which was featured on ad you know all the tiles were made in fans so right. so i think that this is what i'm trying to share with you and my, and our lovely listeners and participants that no matter what you do no matter what you go all these experiences stay within your mental the mental library rather. right and right. they come into play Every now and then. Oh, I love that. And and I, I misspoke. I the article that I'm referring to was in Architectural Digest online and not not a, in the Times. I want to just call attention to something you said and make sure it doesn't get lost. And that is you don't necessarily take a motif, let's say, from something you see in your travels and then simply copy it and paste it right it there's something about it you transform it in some way you translate it into something new that has references back to it but also incorporates its new surroundings and i think that's the real beauty of your work and and why it has so much depth thank you i think it goes back to being curious but also taking from history but not copying from mm-hmm. history. You know, I, I, think, I think I've been very fortunate in learning, being open to learning, but always knowing that one should look at history, learn from history, but you want to give it your own voice. Yes, you know, right. I, I, and that's, I think, what you're getting at really in the comment that you made earlier. I just want to stay with your childhood for just a second back mm-hmm. in Karachi. And I, I read in an interview that you did somewhere, <clears throat> that your your parents' home, they haven't changed it in, in 50 years or something. And I there's, you know, I think those of us that are so immersed in the design world as a professional such as yourself or, or someone like me, you know, we're always changing things. I mean, it's just, it's fun and, and you can't help it. But there is something that you love about your parents' home, I think, right? The fact that it mm-hmm. hasn't changed. Tell us about that a little. So our home is very simple. The construction is concrete. Mm-hmm. So it's very solid. Mm-hmm. All the floors are terrazzo. As, oh. as you know, terrazzo is very much in fashion. Yes, yes, it is. Moment, having another moment. Yeah. It's having another moment, but you know, I grew up with it. And right. It, it's always been in fashion. It's always been like that. Right. We have incredibly beautiful old furniture that's been passed on from generations mm. and it's it's carved wood furniture some made out of teak some made out of mahogany so mm. just going back to my room this bed belonged to my grandfather oh wow. and before that it was his father's so it's been in gener- <laughs> in our home for generations but this is the real deal in the same room I have a mahogany desk the top is covered in vinyl okay <laughs> um, you know which was also from my grandfather I still use it. So these these pieces have become part of my life. Yeah. They are part of my life. They continue to be part of my life. And I find it very grounding. Okay. This 
level of permanence. And in your in one of your comments, Sandra, you had mentioned unchanging stability. Okay, that's right. Exact, that's exactly what <laughs> this is. This sense of permanence is very grounding for me. It actually gives me the freedom to do what I do here oh. with with in terms of living on my own with my partner in our apartment or working with clients. And I believe that change is important because we as human beings are changing. Yeah, you know, right. We're, we're not, we're not <clears throat> permanent. These spaces can be permanent, but we're not permanent. Life is changing by the second. So I would say it's nice to have a balance where you can do both. Right. So the yes. key word really is about balance. But right. I'm fortunate again that I have that, that I can go back you know, three times a year and have that kind of almost feel like I'm in a bubble or uh -huh. you know, in a cocoon uh -huh. in, a, in, a, in a time in a time frozen kind of environment. Right. You know, which is not changing, which has always been the same. I can but, see how that would make you feel so grounded, especially when you've moved so far away from home. I mean, now, I mean, you've been in New York for a long time. I'm sure it feels like home too, but I, yes, I, 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 that, that balance. And I think that that's why holding on to some of our heirlooms, some of the furniture from previous generations that was so well made mm -hmm. it can, can give us some of that. You may not have that childhood home tether, but, but holding on to, I mean, imagine if that desk of yours or that bed of yours moved it, it at least would hold those feelings of that mm -hmm. home, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's also important in in a way of being. Okay. You know, I think I think that when you have connections, and and one could argue these are just things, Amir. Right. Why why hold on to all these things? You know, maybe it's better to not have these things and edit things down. I. I would agree that there is relevance to that as well. Sure. But I think when you have certain elements like this in your life, whether it's a bed or a piece of furniture or a piece of china or a piece of clothing, I think that sentimentality actually also reflects in our personalities. I think it goes deeper than just being an object. Absolutely. The beauty of life. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, well, so speaking of, of changing things up, letting things go, knowing what to hold on, you, I was reading that, that you changed up your home in Manhattan. So fairly recently you redid a bunch of things. So I'm curious to know what it, what did the place look like when you first moved in and you, and you did this big overhaul and then when you're ready for a change, what was your thought process about what you were going to let go of and make room for? Mm -hmm. Important question. So much to share about this question. So my partner and I have been looking for a home to purchase and the search had been going on for many years, but we just didn't see anything that we loved. So, so uh, anyway, we, we saw a listing and we saw you know where it was and the neighborhood appealed to us. So we walked through this hallway this long hallway, and the walls are completely covered in a chocolate brown Venetian plaster. Okay. And we walk through the hallway into the living room. Again, the entire living room is chocolate brown Venetian plaster. The ceilings have these enormous, about like nine inch tall dental, you know, wooden dental moldings, yep. very heavy. Yes. So you almost or need like, Yes, yes. Very formal. Yes, yeah. Very formal. But in this apartment that's from the 1960s, not quite fitting with right. the, you know, with, with, the, um, with the architecture of the building. Then the kitchen was orange walls with green countertops, <laughs> green floor, and mahogany cabinets. Oh. The, bathroom, the bathroom was gold, <laughs> Venetian plaster. Oh and God. the bedroom, bedroom felt like a closet because the entire bedroom was lined up with wall-to-wall -wall cabinetry. Okay. So it literally feel li felt like we were walking into a closet. A closet, right, right. Right. 
So there was no sense of a bedroom. So we looked at that. And, and you we looked at this and you said, perfect. <laughs> this is perfect. my place. <laughs> my partner and I, we, were, we, we couldn't smile because, you know, we could You don't want to give it away. Yeah. We, we, we couldn't show that we were really <laughs> interested though. In my mind, I was thinking, oh, my God, this is perfect. It's so ugly, <laughs> but it's so good, you know, and I, we can make it really beautiful. So anyway, the first step for us, so in, in order to, to answer your question, what we first wanted to do was to bring it down, edit it down to the bare bones. Okay. You know, that was, so that was our first renovation. We completely freed the apartment. We gave it a breath of fresh air. And then slowly we started building it. You know, okay. what do we like? What do we want? We found this beautiful David Hicks 70s wallpaper oh. that covered the wall in our in our living room. Oh. You know, we have so many friends who are artists. Yeah. So we started collecting art artworks from our friends and we had multiple salon walls. We obviously, as you know, we traveled a lot. So we brought back some rugs from Morocco. Mm. So anyway, during during those first few years, our apartment was kind of growing with us. Right, evolving as, with as, you, yeah. As we were growing, as we were evolving. And then, you know, my partner is an amazing artist, but he's also a graphic designer. So he was painting. He painted a beautiful mural in our bedroom that's based oh. on the drawings from Ernest Heckel. Oh, um, wow. You know, they're, they're botanical drawings, yeah. and he did an ent entire wall, the headboard wall of our oh. bedroom in these beautiful mural using sumi ink uh, wow. and a calligraphy brush. So he's, he's a very gifted artist. So that was kind of the first, you know, few years of being there. Yeah. And then, honestly, Zondra, we have just been so busy with our lives. I started my business in 2015. So... I I didn't have time to devote right, to your own space, right, to, right. To our own space. And my partner, same, you know, he's been traveling, working. Mm. So anyway, until the pandemic hit, we hadn't quite had a chance to sit in our mm. apartment and and think about what next? What do we mm -hmm. want? How do we want to refresh our home? What's important to us? What do we love? So yeah. I think a lot of this goes back to what do we love? What yeah. do you love? Keep what you love. And then we gave some things away to family. We gave some things away for donations. We also freed up a, a lot of the walls because we wanted to make room for my partner's new works. Okay. Uh, I think what it does is, what it did is it gave us the opportunity to grow. Yes. And to oh. evolve. You know, for him to continue evolving as an artist, for me to also showcase some of the things that I had been thinking about in my work, in my visual mental library. Right. Um, you said it allowed us to grow. And, and I also loved when you said we finally were sitting with our home Be because we all get so busy, right? We do get caught up in our daily lives and, and our responsibilities. and we don't always have that precious time to just sit, take it in, think about what is, what is, what am I looking at? You know, what, what do I want to be looking at? What do I want to be feeling and sensing? And I just think it's a great, it's a great thing for all of us to do. Before we continue with the conversation, I want to jump in here for a minute and introduce you to my slow style approach to creating a home you love. Just like it sounds, slow style means taking your time and letting your home evolve by responding to what's going on in the rest of your life and reflecting who you are and who you want to become. Now, I know that sounds really abstract, but I don't want you to think that slow style means you're just waiting around for inspiration to strike. I know you need practical, hands-on ways to actually develop your signature style. And that's what I'm passionate about taking the mystery out of creative thinking when it comes to design and helping you define what your dream home actually looks like. And the best way to start is to get really clear on what your style is. Now, I'm not talking about style categories like I'm farmhouse or I'm boho. 
I'm talking about a one-of-a-kind definition that is very specific to who you are. And we've got a blueprint that will help you do just that. It's our free style guide. I'll walk you through some questions and get you thinking about how you want to show up in your home. Just go to littleyellowcouch.com and click on the free style guide button right there on the homepage. I can't wait to see what you come up with. And I'm going to ask you, so don't be surprised when we start having a back and forth conversation about your home. I'm all in and I hope you are too. All right, let's get back to the episode. I want to talk about some specific spaces that you've designed. In one apartment in Chelsea, you 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 talked about how, you know, you you can't help but de- design an entire home in your head. And I thought it was really interesting and and it's something that a lot of our listeners are wondering about, which is how you choose design elements that create a cohesive experience throughout the whole home but still create distinct visual, emotional experiences in each room? So for me, it doesn't take much time to think about what multiple spaces are going to look like Mm -hmm. and how they're going to connect collectively. Okay. Um, in In order to make this comment clearer, I'd like to share with you how we came about designing the Chelsea residence. Love it. Would you reference in your- Yes, we would love to hear that. So, so, you know, when we started talking to our clients, we're a family of five. They they mentioned to us that they lived in in Istanbul. Their home was very clear, close to the, the Blue Mosque. And so, I mean, they shared multiple details about their lives in Istanbul. In building the program for their residents and in sourcing and looking at various things that we had been searching for, we came across a beautiful photograph Mm. of the Blue Mosque. Mm. But we didn't quite just want it to be a black and white photograph. We wanted to take it to another level of sophistication and abstraction. Okay. So we took that photo and we started finding out about different printers. Maybe we could have it printed on a silver paper to oh, give it shimmer, right. to make it more abstract, to make it glimmer. So, you know, in that sense, we started with one element and we thought about placement and then we blew it up. We we blew it up to a seven foot by seven foot image. Mm. And we worked with this local printer in Brooklyn who printed it, gave us a sample. We loved it. And this was all during the building phase. The client also owned a beautiful vintage Turkish carpet, which was, you know, shades of oranges and blues and greens. And we took that and we sort of started to experiment and play. Where should this rug be? Should this be in their living space? Should this be in their bedroom? You know, where would it fit better? And finally, it's sort of, fit better in their bedroom. But with a strong rug of that kind and that caliber, we wanted to balance the room and have a feeling of calmness. Yeah, right? so of course. Because uh, the rug became the hero in the bedroom, yeah. we, kept, we kept everything else sort of subdued. The colors were lilacs and blues. And we found this beautiful Venetian chandelier, glass uh. chandelier, That's mauve color, you know? So everything is soft, a little bit feminine, but it doesn't read as girly. Right, Um, right. In the living room, we took the same mindset. We designed a carpet that had bold gemstones, but more modern in flavor. Mm -hmm. And the living room has these two giant columns that Mm -hmm. were really like a sore thumb in the room. Yeah, I mean, they were they were structural and you had to work around them. Structural and we had to work <laughs> around them. But it's the first thing you saw in the room. Yeah. So we took that challenge and we turned it into a focal point. Right. We took this beautiful, modern, geometric, Islamic pattern of a wallpaper. And we covered the columns with this wallpaper. Yeah, it brought- looks like artwork. Now the columns look so purposeful and, and like they, you know, they were meant to be there. Right. So, so that, those are the kind of, I wouldn't call them tricks, but mm-hmm. those are the kind of elements that we thought about 
And we did research, you know, we looked at many, many different options. There were multiple presentations, multiple layers that we went through to get to where we ended up. Right, but, right. But it's important to have a sense of balance, I would say. And I think that this sense of balance and knowing really comes from doing. Oh, yes. I, yes, I love that you said that. Yes. There's the sense of doing. You know, people, people say, I need to be inspired. <laughs> Inspiration only comes by doing. Yes, it doesn't come to you when you're just sitting there doing nothing, right? Right. You have to do it and do it again and keep doing it till you get it. So I love it. So I would say I've done it. I'm still doing it. And I'm continuously doing it over and over again, because I never say this is the final product. This is, it stops here. Uh I'm constantly saying, no, where can I go next? Because there's another <laughs> layer, there's another journey, there is another step. So we have to take this to the next level. We've done yeah. it well so far. How can we do greater? Right. But let's let's talk more about your process. There, there's a, a project that you did, a loft in the West Village. So in this instance, Sandra, we were working on this beautiful loft for a client. And it's a client that I've known for almost well actually over two decades now and she had shared with me that Amir you know that beautiful vintage Turkish Ushak carpet that Uh I own I really want to put it in the living room what do you think so I said yes I mean that would be beautiful so in this case the foundation of that room started with a rug right because the rug truly was the first element and the hero of the room, right? So knowing what pieces are sitting in that room, what do we need to recover? What do we need to find new? What Mm -hmm. is the color scheme? You know, we couldn't do any of that without starting with the rug. So basically what happened is that the rug was feeding us all this information and energy. Right what the room needs to say. What I try to do as a designer with my team is we try to create a sense of balance. I like to be in a space that doesn't have too many elements screaming for attention. Okay. Which is why I started our earlier conversation with there should be one hero in the room. Right. Right. But, no, of, of course, backing up again, it's it's not, you know, it's not a given rule that each room should just have one hero. Of course, there's one hero and there could be balancing the heroes. Mm-hmm, you know? mm-hmm. But the point I'm trying to make here is that your eyes should be able to rest yeah. and to go around. It's, it's like looking at an abstract painting. It's mm-hmm. like looking at a beautifully composed abstract painting. When you look at a painting, your eye has to go around and and come to a place of rest. Yes. So there's always a focal point, but then there's always this kind of journey that a painting takes you on. Mm-hmm. And that's essentially what we are trying to do with our spaces rooms yeah yeah that that i mean we're getting a art lesson art appreciation 101 along with understanding your your design process which i'm absolutely loving this this is an incredible space i mean it it, one room after another is just sort of uh, this is a great example actually of every room in this space to me feels very distinct there's a personality to each room and yet they do all work together, even though I, I, the rooms are quite different from one another. Mm-hmm. So there's a thread there. And I don't know what the thread is. I don't know if it's, it's not just color. I mean, that's too simple and basic. It, what, what's the thread in that particular apartment, do you think? Is it the artwork? The, the common thread is that sense of, that sense of aesthetics, the sensibility, because the because it's the same thought process, right? So 
I mean, one could argue and say, you know, you could have a, a pink toned living room and then you could have a purple bedroom and then you could have a blue dining room. Why couldn't you do that? Mm -hmm. Of course you could. And it's been done. Mm -hmm. you know, many designers do that to give each room a very strong identity. Mm -hmm. But I think when I think of our work and what we're doing and, and the way I design and the way I live, I think it's that sensibility that I come back to. And I think it's something that's ingrained in you that becomes, that's part of you. You could learn certain aspects of it, mm -hmm. but, but each person's sensibility is unique. Right. Well, I think you have paid close attention to your own sensibility and so that you can bring it forth quite easily. And, and I imagine, because I know you work very co collaboratively with your clients, that you can bring their sensibility out as well, which is what they're hiring you for, because it's hard for a lot of people to translate their sensibility, which is kind of abstract, into concrete design decisions. But it, it, it's just so beautifully represented in this particular apartment. However, it is not my favorite work of yours, which is saying a lot because I really like that one. My favorite, as I mentioned at the beginning, was one that is is referred to on your website as Nomad Residence. Mm -hmm. And what I think you've done so masterfully here is mix things together, not just high, low. People talk about that a lot, but but different styles, different eras, different cultures, so that the objects are having this really interesting conversation with one another. And I think that a lot of people, you know, if you just saw some of these elements individually, like these Louis, I don't know if they're Louis the 15th, 15, Louis, Louis the 15th chairs in this beautiful pistachio green velvet. I saw a picture of that. And then I saw a picture of the boucle mushroom stools. And then I saw a picture of the 1970s, I don't know if it's 70s coffee table. I, I, most people would say, well, those clearly don't go together, right? <laughs> and yet you were able to bring them together and they feel so purposeful. They feel like they're working together. So if it's at all possible for you to unpack how you do that, how do you keep things from not looking like just this jumbled mess? I, I believe that this, this way of being, this way of designing, this way of living is, and in order to get to this level where you feel comfortable putting these elements together, I, I believe comes back to our earlier conversation. It's in the act of doing. It's really Zandra by doing, by experimenting, by making mistakes, mm -hmm. by learning, by learning from these mistakes, by having that sense of curiosity, by uh, being fearless, mm. uh, whether it's in travel, whether it's in living, whether it's in designing, mm. being fearless in your day-to-day -day life. I think what you just said about pulling all those different pieces together that come from different times, different cultures, different sensibilities, and how they all, there's mingle. a harmony there, right? And mingle. Mingle, yes. And and it, it's, and how it seeps into our subconscious. And I, I think that that's really, really true. And I think when you sit in a room designed, like you've designed this one, I think you can really start to feel that. Um, mm -hmm. th th I could talk to you forever. You have so many beautiful projects that we could we could pull apart some more. But I'm going to wrap up with my signature question, which is, why does style matter? I'm going to share a story with you, if I may. Yes. To, to answer this question. Okay. I have a client who, when we met for the first time, she shared with me, that she had just come out of a long-term relationship. Uh. And so she, she wasn't in a good place in life. She was very depressed. Uh. And uh, we started working on her new apartment. And I started thinking about who she is, who she was, who she is, mm -hmm. uh, where is she in life? What are her needs? What can I do to make her life happier? 
Mm. So I developed a beautiful palette of colors, soft tones, calming tones, jewel tones, mm. warm tones of paints, fabrics, furniture, you know, furniture that's very tactile. Anyway, we finished her apartment and Sandra, her first words were, Amir, I wake up every morning and I'm so happy. <laughs> Style has that power. There's a wonderful quote, which is about color. It's not about style. Okay. But yeah. I, think, I think it also says something about style. Color is a power which directly influences the soul. It's by mm. Kandinsky. Mm. And, and I think it also ties into style. You know, a lot of us can say, you know, I just love Navy. I love Navy too. And it's very easy to put on a Navy suit and just go. <laughs> But I think it's really important also to have your own sense of style. So you may, you may put a navy suit or a navy dress and go to work if that's easy for you. But don't lose the curiosity. Be open about having color in your home, experimenting yeah. with color, experimenting with different shapes, yes. experimenting with food, experimenting with textures. You know, I think it's really about opening one's eyes and a sense of curiosity it 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 sort of brings everything full circle at right. least for me yes it's it's all encompassing and i think we can substitute the word style at least in my question with the word beauty uh, why does living in beauty matter you know it it it, it, there's something very fundamental as humans that, that I think we need that. I think we need beauty. We do. Life would be miserable without it. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. This is such a lovely conversation. Thank you so much for taking Thank all this time you. with us. I really appreciate it. Me too. Thank you so much. Okay. I hope that was helpful and inspiring. Do check out our website, littleyellowcouch.com, where you can see photos and links from this episode, learn about my slow style approach to design, and grab your free style guide to get you started on your signature style today. Have a great week. Bye for now.